Good morning, everybody. If you have your hymn, let's turn to page 19. 19. To God be the glory. We sing the first one and the last one. 19.
you this morning, praising your name, giving you all the glory for all the great things that you've done. We're thankful to you for such a wonderful and beautiful day to come into your house. <coughs> Father, we invite you in. Father, we invite you into our hearts. We invite you into the service this morning. Father, we know you're here. We just pray to you, Lord, that you please be with Brother Joey as he brings us your message this morning. Please be with all those who are not able to be here today. Father, help them. Lay your healing hand upon them. Father, in any way that they need your help, so they may be here another day. We're just thankful to you for your kindness and your forgiveness. And pray, Lord, you please continue to forgive us, Father, for our sins. Please have mercy upon our souls. We do confess our sins to you. We repent for our sins. Father, just please forgive us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 672. 672, sweet by and by. Six, what, man? 72. Six, 672. Six, 672. Sweet by and by. We'll sing the first and the last. Six, 72. <coughs> Thank you. 
pretty song. I can't sing it with a lick, but it's pretty. <laughs> 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 Lord, would you bless our all for this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for all your many blessings. And Lord, we ask that you be your brother Joey as he brings your message this morning. And Lord, we ask that you uh, bless those that aren't here this morning and couldn't make it. As we come to this portion of the service, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
service over to Brother Joey. 533. Sunshine in my soul. 533. We'll sing the first, second, and the last of this one, and we'll turn the service over to Brother Joey. Like he said. First, second, and the last, 533. <laughs> Take it and apply it to our daily lives and be the witnesses that we should be for you. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to be reading from the, the first epistle of John in the back of the New Testament there. John wrote uh, three short epistles and we're going to be looking at the first epistle of John, chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. If you'd like to turn back and read along. 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For these are three that testify, the Spirit, the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son 
God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. You know, God doesn't provide us with explanations, does He? He does provide us with something that's a whole lot better. He provides us with promises. And one of his great promises is that we can know that we know that we know that we're born again. We can have blessed assurance. One of the most prolific hymn writers in history was Fanny Crosby. Fanny lived to be 95 years old. And she published over 9,000 poems and hymns. Her life spanned from the uh, birth of, uh, excuse me, the death of the second president of the United States, John Adams, through the birth of the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And uh, she was born without eyesight. <coughs> and what happened was when she was a six-week-old infant, she came down with a bad cold. And this doctor back in that time put these, these mustard uh, packs on her eyes and it left her blind. And uh, her little eyes uh, were left blind for the rest of her life. But the amazing thing about Fanny Crosby was that she was never bitter about what happened. She believed that her blindness gave her a sense of spiritual uh, awareness. And when she was eight years old, she wrote this little poem, and it says this. This is precious. I think you'll enjoy this. Oh, what a happy soul I am. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world, contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and to sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Fanny was also a very outspoken person. She was a she was a, an abolitionist against slavery, and, and by the end of the 19th century, her name was very well known. She was quite the celebrity, and she was called on to read her poems in Congress. Can you imagine that happening today? But Fanny Crosby was invited to the White House on several occasions as she read her works uh, to the Congress there. And Fanny wrote the hymn, which is my all-time favorite hymn, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I, in my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the, all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That's exactly what John is writing in those verses that we just read. You can be saved and you can know for certain that you have been born again. And when you come to that point, it's not just assurance. It's blessed assurance. Now, in the verses we just read from 1 John chapter 5, we see the word testify or testimony. It appears several times in, the, in that passage. And the word testimony and the word witness uh, mean the same thing often. Uh, in a courtroom, uh, a witness gets on the stand and they testify of the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. He gives us three reasons why we can have blessed assurance. One is because the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. Before Jesus went to the cross on Calvary, he promised us that he would send someone to represent him. And that someone was the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I have been with you, but he, the Holy Spirit, will be 
in you. I have been with you, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. And the Holy Spirit never calls attention to himself. He's always pointing to Jesus. We read in John chapter 15, verse 26, where Jesus said, When the Counselor comes, the Holy Spirit, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. <clears throat> there are two witnesses in this passage of Scripture in John 5 that the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Me and Will are battling the same issues here. One is the witness of water, and the second is the witness of blood. Now, when you think about water and blood, does something come to mind? We read in John chapter 19, verse 34, when Jesus was on the cross, they wanted to hurry up the death of the three at Golgotha. So the Roman soldiers, they smashed the legs of the two thieves on each side of Jesus where they couldn't push themselves up to, to breathe. So after they broke their legs, the two thieves suffocated pretty quick and died. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. But, but the Roman soldier, he wanted to make sure. So he got his spear and he jabbed it in Jesus' side. And the Bible says that blood and water flowed out, flowed together. Now, for you medical folks, you know this, that the pericardial sac around the heart contains water and blood. And when they punctured Jesus uh, in the chest there, that pericardial sac was punctured. And water and blood flowed out of Jesus' body together. We find in Ephesians 5.26 that the water represents the cleansing power of the Word of God. It says that Christ loved the church and sanctified it through the washing of water of the Word. The water is what purifies us, and the blood cleanses us from the penalty of sin. Another one of the old precious hymns that we sing is entitled, Rock of Ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. You see the correlation there? Jesus Christ, thank you ma'am, I appreciate that so much. Jesus Christ is the rock of ages. And the word cleft in that old song, means opened up or cut. It's talking about Jesus Christ being cut open. Then it says, let the water and the blood be of sin the double cure. Now, the spiritual truth that we want to see here is a double cure because the water and the blood represent two types of cleansing. Excuse me, just a sec. Save from wrath, that's what the blood of Jesus does, and make me pure. That's what the washing of the water of the word does for us. The blood deals with the penalty of sin, and the water deals with the dirtiness of sin. Both, both the blood and the water represent two powerful witnesses for Jesus Christ. Now the second thing that the Holy Spirit does is he testifies in every believer. The second reason we have blessed assurance is because the Holy Spirit testifies in us. When we place our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in each of our hearts. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul wrote in Romans 8, verses 14 through 16, For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Instead, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, nothing is impossible with God. 
But I tend to be a little bit skeptical when folks uh, tell me that God told them to tell me something. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what I think is, well, if, if God told you, why didn't he tell me? <laughs> you know? And, uh, but there's one thing for sure. God, the Holy Spirit, does speak to our hearts. Amen. And he'll never contradict the Word of God. <clears throat> When you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart, I believe that He will do it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, I'm not talking about an audible voice, but when you sincerely pray and call on the Holy Spirit, He confirms and affirms in our hearts. The problem that we face is that folks are looking for a feeling a lot of times. They say, I just don't feel saved. Feelings don't have anything to do with it. Listen to the sequence for receiving the truth. The first is the facts, which is the truth of God's Word. <clears throat> then, then those facts are accepted by faith. Then there may be feelings or there may not be feelings. Now let me illustrate. Just imagine an old-timey train. The facts are like the engine of that train that gives the power and direction to each of us. And faith is like the coal car uh, that gives fuel to the, to the engine. you got to have both of them. Without the facts, the train doesn't have an engine. And without the faith to fuel it, the train don't move. And the feelings are like that little red caboose. Most trains have a caboose, but you'll never see a caboose pulling the trunk. And you'll never see a caboose going down the track by itself. You may or you may not have feelings, so you can't depend on them. First of all, the facts are that Jesus Christ was God, and he came in the flesh, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross for, for my sins and your sins. He was buried and resurrected, and he ascended up to glory, and he's coming back again one day. Those are the facts. And faith, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that it is by grace we're saved through faith. And faith is the gift of God. Faith is the ability that God gives us to receive those facts and to believe the facts. And when the grace of God is combined with our faith, the result is salvation. The Bible says it is not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I am happy and glad to be a Christian, and I know you are too. But I don't depend on feelings. It's not feelings, facts, and faith. It's facts, faith, and feelings. The Holy Spirit bears witness in our heart. He gives us the facts, and he gives us the faith. And the results of that is wonderful, marvelous unspeakable glory. The first testimony of the Holy Spirit is through the Scripture. We can have blessed assurance because of what, Spirit, what the Spirit says about Jesus Christ. We can have blessed assurance because of what the Spirit says in each of us as believers. And we can have blessed assurance because of what the Spirit says through the Word. The central message all through the Bible from Genesis to Revelations is two words, Jesus saves. John didn't write this letter to tell us how to have eternal life. He wrote this epistle to tell us how we can know that we have eternal life. The key there is in 1 John 5, 13. He said, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Verse 10 says that the one who doesn't believe God's record calls him a liar. Now, what if you asked me to give you directions to Abbeville from here? Well, I'd say to go out here to 95 and turn north. And when you left, you went out here to 95 and you turned right and went south. Well, you'd be calling me a liar because 
You didn't put any faith in my directions. God has given us specific directions in his precious book on how to get to heaven. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ. And if anybody doesn't believe this record, John says that you're calling God a liar. And that's the most serious charge there is. The written testimony there in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12 says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. The Word of God gives us two facts about eternal life. That Jesus is the source and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is not a quantity of life. Eternal life is a quality of life. And eternal life doesn't begin when you die. Eternal life begins when you're born again. When you receive Christ, you receive eternal life. Because Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He's the source, and he gives us that certainty of eternal life. <clears throat> when you stand before God and he asks, why should I let you into heaven? It's not because of some emotional experience that you had when you was a child or a teenager. It's because, Father, you say in your word that anyone who has your son has eternal life. Jesus is the Lord of my life, and he died for my sins. It's not by feelings. It's the facts of the Word of God combined with the faith that God gives us through the gift of grace. We can all rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and have blessed assurance. Now, I want to finish up with a little story here. We've all heard stories about Coach Bear Bryant, haven't we? My niece gave me a little devotional book a couple of Christmases ago. It's got all kinds of stories in it centered around football. And there's one story about Alabama being ahead by five points. Uh, towards the end of the game, uh, Alabama had the ball on the five-yard line. And they just needed to run out the clock. That's all they needed to do. And Coach Bryant's first string quarterback was injured. So he put in his second string quarterback. And this fellow was one of the slowest fellows on the team. Uh, Coach Bryant told him, he said, Now, son, just hand the ball to the running back. Tell him to run it up the middle and run, it, run out the clock. That's all you got to do. And whatever you do, don't throw a pass. So on first down, he handed the ball to the running back, and he was tackled. A few seconds ran off the clock. Same thing happened on second down. And on third down, on third down, the game was almost over. All the seconds were just about off the clock. And the quarterback got the ball, and he saw this big old tidy and standing in the end zone all by himself. And he said to himself, this is my chance. This is my chance for glory. So he passed that ball. Well, the other team happened to have this All-American safety that stepped right in front of that tight end and intercepted the pass. And he ran down the sidelines toward the other goal line. And the only player that had a chance to tackle him was guess who? That second string quarterback. That safety ran to the 30. He ran to the 20. He ran to the 10. And lo and behold, to everybody's surprise, the second string Alabama quarterback tackled him, and the game was over, and Alabama won by five. Well, when Bear met the other team's coach at the center of the field, the coach said, Bear, my safety is one of the fastest fellows in this conference. Our scouting report said that your quarterback was one of the slowest players on your team. I don't understand how in the world he caught him and tackled him. And Bear said, well, it's like this, Coach. Your player was running for a touchdown. 
my player was running for his life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I said that little, gave y'all that little story. Because if, if you happen to be running hard for your life, still working hard, trying to be saved, or if you're tired of having that, I hope I'm sa saved salvation, or I think I'm saved salvation, li listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit as He testifies about Jesus, as He testifies about you, and as He, as he testifies through the Scriptures. And then once and for all, you can say, I know that I know that I know that I have eternal life. Amen. And I will never again allow that old devil to make me doubt my salvation. Mm -hmm. I know whom I believe. And I believe he is able to keep that which I committed to. And you can say beyond the shadow of a doubt, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation. I have been purchased by God. I'm born of his spirit. And I'm washed in his blood. May we pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the assurance that we have in your son Jesus. And the, the fact that we have eternal life. Now, Father, help us not keep this, this glorious promise to ourselves. Help us to be the witnesses that we should be and go out to tell a lost and tell a lost and dying world what they need to be saved, do to be saved. Lord, just Give us the strength and the courage to do that. Our world needs it so bad, and we're the only ones that he can do it. Help us to be uh, the, the legs and the arms, uh, an extension of you, Father, as we go out into this world. Father, during this time of invitation, uh, if there's anyone here who needs to make a decision for you this morning, we pray that it will be done, and we will give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Brother Jeremy, what's our hymn of invitation? As if I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, 444, <laughs> blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine as we all stand in sun. <laughs> to our fellowship here. Kathy tunes in every Sunday morning by uh, YouTube. So she's also moving her letter. So do I hear a motion that we receive Kathy? I'll make that same motion. Second. 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 Amen. Amen. So let's just give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. 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 Amen.
And uh, I'm going to ask that uh, Bill, and, Bill and Judy, no, I'm not going to, I'm just going to ask y'all to stand up here. And let's uh, just make it formal, let's give them a right hand of fellowship. Uh, Earl said he didn't want me hugging him, so I'm going to So uh, let's, let's all love on them at the, after our closing prayer and uh, just uh, give all the glory to the Lord. Just so thankful this morning. Brother Ed, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, Father. Every day that you give us is just such a blessing, and I thank you for that. I thank you for allowing us to have a part in it. Father, I just thank you for this church, for this church family, and what it means to each one. And I just pray a blessing on each one that makes it a church, Father. And Father, I just thank you for these that have come this morning. I just ask for a special blessing on them. Yes, God. And Father, I just uh, ask that you just continue to bless Brother Joey as he leads his church, Father. And Father, I just ask that you just go with us now as we go our separate ways. Just watch over us and keep us safe. All this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.